The Jerry Lewis Award for On-Screen Athleticism is awarded to... From Doctor Who, Elizabeth Sladen. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I wonder if you realize how appropriate a Jerry Lewis Award is to me. Because not many of you may know that whenever there was a quiet moment on set with nothing else to do, Tom would sing me a certain Dean Martin song. So thank you for the memories. It was embarrassingly wonderful. We just walked in the studio and we went right back to square one. It's like we'd never been apart. I don't know why no one's thought of doing Radio Doctor Who before. Have you heard it? Oh, I hope you enjoy it. It, it, it really is good. They do think Barry Letts, who wrote it and um, was sitting in the box when we were recording it, he said, I put things in this story that I could never have put on television. So I hope you enjoy it. I mean the sex scene, not para. There's no sex in the TARDIS. What are you talking about, young man? Where did you hear that? Not from me. Who from? I want to know. Is that, is that the uh, Christmas outtake or something you've heard about? Oh, well, give it away. Yes, it away. I, I, I have to have all the information if I'm going to answer. Oh, no, that's not a sex scene. No, I don't know who told you that. No, we, we tune in and um, I think um, Jeremy has um, an experience of, um, is it dancing with a girl or something? It's terribly tame, but I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> what did I think of my first episode? Right. I don't think they ever let Sarah be as strong again, as in Time Warrior. Um, I don't think it would have been called Doctor Who if they'd gone on writing for her like that. There's a format that Doctor Who works on that fits, and you, you fit the format. But they did allow my character to come in very strongly. I remember being absolutely terrified. I, could, I, I was counting the days off. I thought, seven days' time, and I, I'm going to be on camera with John Pertwee. I, I thought, how can I handle this? I'd, I'd already done the filming by then, but it was somehow the studio that held a fear for me. And I can remember... The weirdest thought as I went on for my first scene, I'd, I'd rehearsed it, and, we, and all of a sudden I thought, how do I stand? Do I stand on one leg? Do I stand straight? I, and I, I've got this um, video, uh, this, this recording of myself. I was standing ramrod like a soldier, and I'm, I swear one of my legs must be shaking. Uh, but it was, um, it was a shame. I did that story, and then we had a three-month break. I would very much have liked to have done that and gone on. It was like starting again when we came to do um, Dinosaurs, and I hadn't seen John in the meantime. And the first thing he said to me, he said, God, why did you cut your hair? Because <laughs> I cut it very short by then. Those are my memories, anyway. It's really lovely to remember Ian today, 30th anniversary. Um, Ian was far too um, clever to be an actor, really. I remember seeing him at rehearsal one day, because sometimes you have quite a bit of hanging around time. And he was literally walking around the rehearsal room, putting one foot in front of another. I said, what are you doing, Ian? And he said, do you realize how many steps it would take to walk to Hong Kong. And he was actually working out the mileage and working out the footage. I swear to you, he was. Whether he got it right is immaterial. He was actually doing that. My first meeting with Ian, he was very open, very, hello, how are you? It's lovely to be here. And he was a lovely balance because I actually then, as a companion, had someone else who got shouted at and sat on and tripped over besides me. <laughs> And he was, he was wonderful about the writing of the books. He would ring me up. We live very near each other. In fact, his eldest son has just become a father, just before I left. Yeah. Um, he rang up and he said, look, Sarah's a um, bit of a prat in this episode. Do you mind if I change it a bit and write her up? I said, no, no, I don't mind at all if you can do it. He was very involved with how the program looked, not just from an actor's point of view. And I think he gave such good value. Um, it would be lovely to, to see him here today. I had great, great fun with Ian Martyr. He used to say to me um, every time before we went for a take, is it an OBB scene, Liz? And that was out of breath. 
oh, out of, oh, oh, be scene, out of breath. And he always used to remind me if I had to be OOB before, before a scene. And I went to do an advert one day for the Daily Mail, and who was playing my husband, but Ian Marta, and he said, is it an OOB scene today, Liz? <laughs> he was wonderful. Well, that was to do with bodily functions again. They were really mean to the girls sometimes. Um, I think it was my first CSO, which is color separation overlay, which is now called chroma key, where you stand on this blue and you don't see anything around you, but over the other side is a big monster and you're meant to be reacting to it. So I did what I had to do and the cameraman came when it was over, tapped me on the shoulder and he said, Liz, didn't wardrobe give you your special CSO underwear? I said, no. Well, he said, we're going to have to shoot this again because we could just see right through your costume. And I flew to wardrobe and they'd locked the door, they'd gone off wherever they'd gone and I, I actually fell for it. I worked on the premise that people tell the truth. <laughs> and I really believed them and I was most embarrassed. Well, my eight-year-old discovered Doctor Who 18 months ago and she couldn't quite believe it. Um, she's enjoying it. She hasn't seen many because I don't have many episodes. Um, but she thinks I'm quite good. Which is, which is very nice. And she's dying to hold Tom Baker's hand. She's furious that she's downtown Chicago looking in the shops and not sitting up here with me. But then I, I think eight-year-olds are really into performing and audiences. So um, she, she's really into it at the moment. No, I don't think I've got anything to add. It's just kind of best friends about caring. It's a very simple format. And, you know, the assistant is put in the position where each week she has to make really the same mistakes. And I used to try and reason it that... I don't care what mistakes I make if I'm going to help my best friend. You'd do it, wouldn't you? Uh, I have been asked, but I've said no so far. I've just got cold feet. I don't know why. Um, well, I, I don't know. I went to convention in Bournemouth, and my husband saw they were showing someone a video, and he thought they were really quite good, so I might think again. I don't know. I think I was... Oh. I was... Um, reading something that he sent me in August, but at that time my daughter was doing something that I needed to be at home for and around. Uh, so, um, I mean, I just put it out of my mind. I don't know why. I just, um, either I really want to do something and you should do it 100%, or maybe the time is not right. I, I don't really know anything other than that. I think there's always a part of me that's nervous in, in whatever I do when I have to be on show, because there's always a part of you to think, you know, people are paying to see me. Would I pay to see me? <laughs> I don't know. I hope I've got something interesting to say. But I don't know. I find it much easier to face a room full of people. Um, maybe it's the coward's way out, where I can't see your eyes. When I have maybe three people around, strangers, that I have to talk to about Sarah Jane, I find that much more daunting. I find, I find this very comforting. I don't find this... Um, I don't find numbers threatening at all. I, I, I find it um, much easier to sort of talk about things. But well, my, my working life seems to have come full circle because I've, within the last few months, done the radio, done a Doctor Who. I never thought I would ever appear as Sarah Jane, let alone in a costume I wore nearly 17 years ago. I've yet to see it, I, I, but that was for the children in need. You can't really say no to that. And um, a radio program about Doctor Who and um, 30 years in the TARDIS, which I think will go out on Monday. As far as professional work, when I go back home, there's nothing for me that I know of at the moment. I go and do a drama class every week with small children, and I go and teach at my daughter's school one half day a week in a class two years younger than hers. You can do English or maths, whatever, or art, whatever the teacher wants. And um, I sort of put things on hold when I had Sadie, not because I don't think you should work and have children. I think it's great if you can do it. I just found it terribly, terribly difficult. And I found myself looking at the clock and wanting to be home with her. So in the end, that's what I did. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's neither a vice nor a virtue. It's just a fact. So as of maybe a year ago, I really miss working now very much. But it's not really up to me. Um, people forget you're older and you have to... Um, just kind of start again. I mean, there is work, but again, I don't really want to go away from home for a long time, so I seem to want my cake and eat it. Whether I'll get either is another matter. So it's really nice to be here. Thank you. We ask questions. Okay. And you answer. Someone stop. Careful, yeah. put your hand down. <laughs> <laughs> You're just the other room. <coughs> there are so few of you here. Can I ask 
Can I know your names? I know Kevin. Is that Bob? Kerry. Kerry. You haven't remembered it yet. <laughs> Did I see Bob last time as well? You must look like a Bob. It could have been. Kerry. You all have to say your names. Lance. Lance. Yeah. Kathy. Like the first day of class. Barbara. And He's Jay. 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 Sorry. And your name is? <laughs> I just signed the wrong name. No. <laughs> I just signed. I haven't signed something that signs there. Oh, <laughs> I've not done that ever in my life. <laughs> Coming to America will do this. I mean, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> You're in Chicago, though. And it was snowing before, isn't that lovely? Oh, that was so I'm you were coming in. But it's so clean. The snow here is just, it just looks so much clean. It's very slushy back home. It's very mm. wet snow. I mean, well. it, it's wet when it lands huh. in London. Mm. It just seems to be so clean. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, Liz. Right back when I started the, the club, I said, oh, we did that? an interview, that's 1990, so right about the same time you did the interview with Gene Riddler. Oh, right, the magazine. I And you said something about, you really didn't think you would ever do a convention again. I um, didn't at the time, that was the truth. Well, that's, well, I mean, I, I'm not calling you a liar. I'm just oh, no, saying, no. I'm not complaining. I'm not going to argue, it's all right. And, and it's just, you know, I'm just curious what made you change your mind. Sadie. Oh. It was 18 months ago, my, my eight-year-old discovered Dr. Who. Oh. <laughs> and I go in to teach one day at school. And the children were playing Doctor Who in the playground. And I couldn't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it, it, of course, it's got a new audience now because of the, the, the video releases. Mm -hmm. There have been lots more video releases. So all of a sudden, it's sort of, um, it's got a fresh audience. So all the people that I kept telling about Doctor Who, they've sort of maybe grown up and moved on. And there's, there's a new audience who don't know about it. And so I didn't feel I was going over old ground again. And she asked me um, what conventions were like. I was showing her some photos and she saw some Doctor Who videos. And she said, could she go to one? Mm -hmm. So it coincided with doing the Doctor Who radios. That came back into right. my life. Right. Doctor Who came back in a big way mm -hmm. with the radios. And at the same time, I was invited to go to Bournemouth to a small convention. And we were invited as a family. And it was, um, it was over a weekend, so I took her. Mm -hmm. And she got so much pleasure out of it that I got pleasure out of it. Okay. I heard I mean, she took over the uh, charity auction. She did. I had to tell her to take it to her. She <laughs> bid a hundred pounds for something. Go to bed. She had a oh, eight, eight year old. I mean, people were so nice to her. She got a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. And um, but it was in such a nice way. Mm -hmm. And with, with the radio, as I felt coming here, I sort of got a peg to hang my hat on again. Mm -hmm. It felt fresh again. There's something new to talk about. So that's what changed my mind. Mm -hmm. And now, you know. Did the, did the response from the fans to your character, did that overwhelm you at the time? I mean, when did, when did it first come into your life, the, the fandom aspect? When I was on the program. You mean the first time I realized? Yes. I didn't realize for a long time, because I was just going into work. It was another job. And I, I had no idea. I didn't used to do promotions. The doctors did a lot of the weekends. I did one or two for charity. And it wasn't really until um, towards the end of the season with John that I, I, I sort of realized I had a following. You know, it was very strange, because I hadn't, I hadn't done anything before that had had this sort of mass response. I'd done a job and then it had been forgotten and I'd do something else and then that's part of um, it. It's like just ending. But this sort of went on and it has gone on and on and no one's more amazed than I have. Really. It's incredible. When was the first time you started getting fan mail? I got fan mail um, fairly early on. Um, but it, 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 it just wasn't real because you'd just be sent by the office and things to sign mm -hmm. and you'd sign it and send it back. And um, it, it, it wasn't tangible because it wasn't people, it was just things coming in. And I, I was just busy learning the scripts. I, I wasn't thinking about what effect I was having. It was just a matter of doing it. You're more or less caught up with the job and you couldn't... Yeah, and it, it really was. You had to... I never knew where I was going. 
I just used to get on the bus when we were doing filming. And, and sometimes you'd be doing it out of order, or you'd be doing two at the same time. Very rarely, but sometimes it happened. And it was enough just to think of that. And I never went anywhere where there were crowds of people, because you go to rubbish tips and you go to chalk pits and sand pits. You know, <laughs> mind you, one or two would come out of the woodwork, you know, but you didn't usually get a gaggle around. You were just with the people you were working with. Yeah. And, and that's all you thought about, what you were doing. I mean, really, in a big way, fandom, I suppose, as such, came when I first came to America in 1980. I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe this followed. And I went back and I told BBC Enterprises about all these things I'd seen out there. And I mean, they weren't terribly interested. Two years later, they wished they had listened to me and been interested because that was the time when if Doctor Who was really going to make it bigger, it could have happened. It can't happen now. If the time has passed. Now, one inevitable question is, have you ever, is there a comparison between, let's say, the British fans and the American fans on how they respond or... I think American fans, I think um, at the very first convention I went to, it was less children. They, they, they were older fans, you know. Um, and also the degree of enthusiasm. Americans let you know that they like something. Um, but I don't think there's that much difference now. I think it's, 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 a, it's a good balance now. I did, a, uh, I did a, an interview at Moni, the Museum of the Movie Image. <coughs> John Nathan Turner asked me to do it. I honestly thought someone would let him down. He was sort of asking me at the last minute. <laughs> so I thought, I must do this. And I wasn't terribly keen on it, because I had to talk about myself before Doctor Who. And that's terribly difficult, because you don't think of it in those terms. And um, someone told me afterwards, oh, you look very nervous, Miss Lake. And I said, well, what? There didn't mean anyone you wanted to be there. You were so quiet. You hardly asked any questions. They were, they were very, very rest of which I don't think um, then that's a British occupation, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I was lucky enough to go to England last March on another Who Goes There oh, trip. Right. And Who did you see then? I um, met Sophie and um, Gary Russell. Oh, from oh lovely, from Marvel. Yep. He's very helpful. Because mm -hmm. I forget things and I ring him up and I ask him, what did I do that? When we did the Doctor Who um, radio, I didn't realize immediately. I read the script and, 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 this, and Sarah was introduced to the Brigadier. And I didn't realise that they put the story way back to after Time Lord and before um, the dinosaur one. Mm -hmm. And there were a few things that I really couldn't remember. So I would phone Guy up and say, how's she doing this? Thing? Does she know so easy? Mm -hmm. And he knows all packed. Yeah, he does. I he interrupted you. We, uh, yeah, we went up to uh, Wales, to Port Marion. Oh, did you? We saw the stairs that you ran down and everything. <laughs> it's really Such a strange beautiful. place. It is a strange place, isn't it? One mm -hmm. man's creation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I had that one, didn't I? I preferred the one at Ealing Studios and Planet of Evil. Mm -hmm. Because all of a sudden, boy, it was wonderful because it was indoors. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, uh, you were in this garden of evil. But it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it was lovely. I loved it. Was location filming ever really difficult for yes. you? <laughs> many times. <laughs> many times. Many times. It was very cold when I was filming. Um, so we all used to wear long johns. And the doctors are taller, a lot taller than I am. So if you want to be in a two-shot with them, you have to, you know, wear high heels, the high heel boots. And it's very difficult if you're running over stony ground. <laughs> so when I could, when the camera's going up to there, I'd wear pumps or something. But sometimes in long shot, I couldn't. And uh, the stunt arrangers were great, especially Terry Walsh. Because he used to go down the track for me and say, no, don't go there, go there, just go there, don't step on that. Right. And he, he, he would just sort of have uh, fairly weak ankles. I was mm. always going over on them. Mm. So, uh, yeah, but it was... Um, it was lovely. I like outdoors. I like the catering, all the Mr. Kipling cakes at tea time. It was nice. The same scene I remember, I think it was Master Man Dragon, it was in Port Marion. You had to go down these long staircase with like three inch heels. And Did I? I think I remember something about yeah. that. It looked like you were about to kill yourself any second. So I remember the years of very high. <laughs> <laughs> They were, there was one uh, episode where Tom Baker did one of his own stunts and then was sorry for it because he broke his uh, I heard shoulder it. bone. Yes, I had a crack. God. Oh. I was sitting on Dartmoor and they, they made a nappy for me because I had to sit in this wet yuck for ages and um, I had this thing on my forehead. And I gave so much away, I was given that. I don't think no, God. Uh, and I was sitting there and I had to have my eyes closed and I could hear he was fighting with Terry Walsh, I think, as the. Sometime. Yes, yes, because Kevin couldn't 
do that, that's right. He was for some time, but he had a heart condition and whatever. And I heard it crack. Well, I heard something crack. I mean, I didn't know at the time. And I heard these noises, and I thought, God, this scene sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> and really realistic. And then, of course, you know, Tom had broken on his collarbone. So Terry Walsh dressed in Tom's clothes, and they just filmed over shoulders and that to accommodate. It's a lovely story about that. Kevin Lindsay was wonderful. He was on my very first one, Time Warrior. And he came back to do a Sontaran of a different name. And by that time, um, Kevin didn't really want to do a lot of climbing. And we had to climb very high and stay there because it was OB. And they would um, bring everyone down for lunch. And he said, well, look, I don't really want to climb all the way down. Get out of this. He said, could someone be kind enough on a tray to bring my meal up? I don't mind. You know, I'll eat it here. And then I'm here ready for after lunch. And we got up back after lunch and he was killing himself now. And he said, I was sitting eating my lunch with my potato head on, putting the food in. He said, a woman and a dog were walking around the corner. And his dog just saw him with this woman. He's like, I hope they're all right. He said, I think I gave them a bit of a shock. <laughs> was there any time that you were in any danger when you were filming the series? Yes, maybe some of you heard it before, forgive me. We were in Wookie Hole underground. And I don't know, I mean, oxygen is very sparse when there's a big company and you're all underground and you can't go up for tea breaks because it would take too much time. You just go up at lunchtime. And um, the crew were filming on the bank over there. And I was twice the distance maybe from the back of the hall. I'm not very good at distances if someone wants to see how far that is. Twice that distance to where I would be standing on the other bank. And the director came over and he said, I want you to get on this little boat and it's about so high out of the water. It was really like a ski board thing, and between stop and go on, on the throttle was like that. And he said, you have to get on it, zoom in a circle over there to the other bank, get off and run away. And there's this current at 30 miles an hour going that way, and there's, there's a hole there where it goes down where they've lost people. He said, well, do you want to do this, Liz? I thought, well, who else is going to do it for me? I looked around, I said, well, huh. Terry said, well, do you want me to do it for you, Liz? I sort of looked at him. I looked at my very nice knitted jumper or whatever I had on. I thought, no, let's stretch it for the studio. <laughs> no, it's all right, Terry, I'll do it. He said, oh, well, be careful. So we did it. And it, I mean, I really didn't like it very much, but I felt very happy when it was over. Then at the end of the day, they had some time left, and that's when it gets dangerous. And he said, Liz, we saw you on there. He said, I'd like a shot. We'll be over there. All you have to do is run up in the mud, lie on it. And he said, I know you don't like it very much. Don't, don't, don't put the engine on. Just, just, just go out to there, and we'll pick you up in a rowing boat. And I said, well, if I don't put the engine on, the current will take it that way. And the guy who made it said, no, it won't. This goes the way the nose is pointing. So you believe him, because he made it. So I got on it, and I lay down on it, and I waited, and I could see the boat coming out. And it just turned, the current, and it just started to go. And I thought, shit, what do I Excuse me, what do I do? <laughs> so I jumped off. I, and I had these com combat boots on, and they, they were really heavy. No one knew how deep this place was. And I can remember treading water, and I saw Terry Walsh on the other bank, and he doubled as an Exelon. And he, I saw him rip this stuff off, and he had his um, wet, wet suit underneath, and he just dived in, and he, and he got me out. And I can remember thinking, honestly, I had false eyelashes on at the time. Sometimes I wore them, sometimes I didn't. I thought, oh, I lose my false eyelashes. <laughs> <laughs> Strange things, you know, stupid that go through your mind. That was not very comfortable. I mean, it was wonderful. They said to Terry, go and get changed. He said, no, he said, I'll just wait. I'll just see this do this shop. You know, you know, thank God he did. And the boat actually just sort of wedged. It wedged on the rock. I don't know what would have happened. But quite a few people came down from London to see if I was all right in the hospital, I remember. It's very silly. I mean, you shouldn't do things like that. Really. <laughs> Is there something, uh, something that you would, uh, if you had the role of Sarah Jane today, is there something you would like to do with the character that you did not do in the series? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I've never been asked that before. Tonight, Sarah Jane is on again, actually, in Children in Need. I never thought I would play her again, and I didn't really want to, not on film. But for Children in Need, you can't really say no. Um, <coughs> I don't know. Yes. I've seen some recently, and I hadn't seen them for a long, long time. As I say, I've watched some with Sadie. We've got a few at home. I think I should have um, done less. I think I have practiced I think, I think I should have just played it down with you. In truth. I, I would do less. should do what? Less. 
less, less reacting. Um, just kind of maybe it's with age and experience that comes. But I, I saw some seeds and I thought, oh God, you're over it. There's a bit of that about it. How do you watch yourself? Do you watch your own stuff? And, and have I, ha I haven't it? even listened to the Doctor Who radios that have gone out. Yeah. Um, I don't like doing it um, very early on because you look for the wrong things. You look for your makeup. You look for how it gets in the way. I find it much better to look and listen afterwards if I can. And then you're removed from it. You're mm -hmm. not quite as um, bound up in you watch it more as a whole. Yeah, that's when they say, like, the worst critics are the artists themselves, mm -hmm. when they look at their own work. Well, you never think you're going to look like that. You sometimes really believe you're someone else. Well, not really, but you sometimes sort of think. And then you see yourself sometimes doing the same things, and you think, oh, oh you know, things that you do naturally. So, I mean, you've only got yourself to work on, yeah. so you must use yourself. But when you sometimes see those mannerisms creep in, and especially to someone like Sarah, where it's not written other than for you, yeah. you are Sarah because um, maybe in a stage play you do it, you'll say, um, Mimi is um, 27 years old. She has brown hair, blue eyes. She thinks so-and-so, so-and-so of her father. She has a slight limp. They, they clothe you more because it's all written there for you. But with Doctor Who, you're given really a great license on your own to create something. So I suppose you lose more of yourself. So you do see mannerisms creeping in that um, I suppose to try and make yourself feel comfier. Yeah. Did you have in any power to like change lines that you felt were uncharacteristic of Sarah Jane in the series? Yes, I used to complain quite a bit, and it's really quite wrong because they did allow us a great deal of license to, um, you know, they never really said writers or producers, you can't do that, or so and so, so and so. Yeah, they were very good actually, because there came a point where actually you did know sometimes what would be comfier, what would, what you'd maybe just done before or found that you could use again. Yeah, they were, they were very good like that. I mean, sometimes. Tom used to say, now, I've just got an idea. And he said, I know I have a hundred ideas, but just once, it might be a good one, so please listen. And that's a wonderful attitude, because if you, if you don't mind being shouted down, you know, 500 times, even if you're only right for three or four, that will make it better. You know, so you have to keep offering. I thought it was kind of funny you mentioned that you thought you were overacting mm -hmm. on your Who episodes, mm -hmm. but... I always thought character of Sarah was, was realistic, was very well done. Well, it's, it's a program that isn't really realistic as well, is it? You try and find something real, and then my thing was to kind of notch it up a bit into, into strip cartoon. I used to say sort of in, in strip cartoon in my mind. Um, and, but maybe you can do it bigger sometimes, but then you must find the places to bring it down. Um, you know, and sometimes you're enjoying it so much, and I suppose maybe you get overconfident, because you're so comfortable with the role. And you're having actually such a good time. I had a wonderful time on her. I really did. <coughs> Excuse me. So I think maybe, not all the time, but there are times when less is best. Yeah. Mm. You know, and then when you want to really make a point, then make yourself heard. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm very Hello. critical, I suppose. I, I think most people one of the complaints some fans have about the character of Sarah Jane is that she started out being sort of a strong feminist character uh, in the earlier stories and then sort of changed into more of a screamer and um, more... The strongest role they ever wrote was the first four parts I ever did, Time Warrior. They wouldn't dare let her go on like that because she didn't fit the format like that. Yeah, well, the, yeah. Thing, the interesting thing about Time Warrior was that you weren't a companion at the outset. You were doing all this That's stuff right. on your own and took a while before That's you right. In, in, in fact, I saw Time Warrior very, very recently. I thought that stood up quite well. It's a good one. I, 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 I think that's the strongest they ever wrote for Sarah. I think it was the best one she ever had. <laughs> <laughs> Not that it was all downhill it after all went that. Downhill but, after um, that. Yeah. There's a format you have to adhere to, otherwise you haven't got Doctor Who. Yes. There was one story that was sort of push and pull, where uh, Genesis of the Daleks, where Sarah was both like the headstrong person and the scream, where it sort of, it like sort of swung back and forth. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I like that one as yeah, well. Yeah, leading the revolt in the rocket yeah. silo. It, it was nice when I had really something you know, to do. Mm -hmm. Ian Marta, who it was nice to remember on his 30th anniversary, mm -hmm. um, he, was, he was wonderful to, to work with. Because he used to say, look, Liz and I are not really contributing to the scene. We're, we're stuck over there being captured. And they used to, because we were in the scene, the camera felt it had to accommodate us to show it. 
And sometimes you say, can we really not be in this scene? You know we're there, we don't really, because when you're there you have to be sort of acting and sometimes the scene isn't about that and it may be distracting. So sometimes we would just get, get off out of the scene and it worked better. So that when you were then in it, you had something to offer. Were you were you asked to appear in the five doctors fairly early on in the planning? I wouldn't stages? know about that. It seemed a, a bit of a rush for everyone. It was rather like a command performance. Everyone went back to do it. I don't know. I think I was asked, to my knowledge, about the time as the other companions. Um, I suppose they got the doctors first. I don't know how they managed to use everyone, really, to the detriment of the story. Um, again, it needed more time, I think, to yeah. set it up. Yeah. It was kind of maybe a last minute idea. Well, everyone always makes fun of that scene where you fall down the little hill <laughs> it does and scream down the hill. Did they tell you to do that? Do you think I would have done it? <laughs> no, but I mean, I, I, it just seemed like, you know, that it just seemed that they could have found a higher hill or something to make it a little yes. more realistic. It's pretty is exciting. That, is that the one where I get dragged up? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I'll tell By you about winch. realistic. <laughs> they tied it to the wheel. They tied the rope to the wheel. Where was the rope on me? I, whatever happened, it wasn't very comfy in there, and they had to have someone pull me up. Um, it didn't work very well, did it? No. No, I don't think it did. It, it wasn't. Kind of it wasn't a good hill, actually, because you you weren't down. You were kind of. You could have got up a lot easier. I hate having to fake something, because you have to fake most things. And when you think the audience <coughs> can see you faking it, it's all right if you can blind them with science. But there was another, like in Morbius. I I I got mad on that one because there's one point where I am in the dungeon with Morbius. I think. I don't know if it's with Morbius or with the monster. I don't know. And I could have escaped so easily. I said, all I've got to do is run past him out there. No, 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 you can't. I said, oh, no, but can you give me something that will be in my way to stop? Because I can just walk out of there. And that was another time. Yes, they used that, just occasionally, it used to make you mad because, you know, you felt a prat. Really. How, how did that? Sorry. No, excuse me. Um, that brings me about, uh, when I was talking about the, um, the uh, characteristics of, of Sarah Jane, about her early on being very headstrong and feminist, and then later on she became more of a, almost schoolgirlish, you know, in the hairstyles and... Well, yes, you see, if you go around in the TARDIS <laughs> for that many years, you change. It does things to your brain. Well, I, what, what I was wondering was, um, on a production standpoint, um, how much that had to do with, say, like the change in producers from Barry Letts to Philip Hinchcliffe. To, was that just sort it of an changed. unconscious it was a, No, no, it was very conscious, mm -hmm. but it was mainly on my part, and no one seemed to complain about it. Because the way the scripts came in, you had a very different doctor with Tom to John. You had less earthbound stories. You know, I wasn't going home at night, you know, for cheese and crackers and shopping at Marks and Spencer's. I was stuck up in space. Any, I, I could have worn anything. I could have worn Queen Victoria's um, coronation robes. I could have had anything I wanted in the TARDIS. I think I was quite conservative, really. I just wanted to show this facet that if she'd been going around in space with this guy with two hearts, you, you are on a different planet. You're different. You're changed. And I wanted that to, to show. And I think it's a shame that people don't let more childish qualities. Children are wonderful. They're very honest. And I wanted the earth thing to go away from that, and that kind of naivety and enjoyment to come in. We're getting very deep here, aren't we? I wasn't going to tell you that. It's very interesting because That's the truth. I noticed um, that that happened with the change of doctors. And it almost, as far as the character goes, it seemed uh, at first that you kind of missed that headstrong feeling. Because you don't want to. Do you not the, think she was still headstrong? I, I, I. She was well, always it, headstrong. Headstrong <laughs> in terms of being stubborn, but the the, the independent sort of, of angle that they were. Uh, that well, it's really funny you should say that because I thought with John, because <coughs> John is the doctor, like he looks after the little chicks. He's the gentleman doctor. He puts the cloak around the little chicks to guide them and tells them what to do. I felt with Tom's doctor, he actually said, "Oh, get on with it, Sarah." I felt he sent me actually way more, that I, that I actually had more to do on, on my own volition than him taking, what, 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 go away. I, I, you know, I felt there was a lot of that about it. 
um, with Tom, but I don't know. That's interesting. There's a lot of underlying, uh, uh, sort of an underlying form to all that. You know, you could watch yes. all the episodes for a long time and come up with all these different theories about everything. And that's why I wanted to know if it was who had the direction on that. And I'm, I'm very interested I in the fact it. that it was you. But no one complained or they liked it, so no one. I, I, I never had that put to me by, um, by a director or a producer. That's very interesting. Outside of uh, the revitalization of Doctor Who, what have you been doing uh, now? Since Doctor Who. Since Doctor Who, actually, that I left Doctor Who. Well, no, more like recently, like the past couple of years. What, what have you been up to? Outside of, let's say, Well, the since radio Doctor show. Who, I've done ten, and then I can be more specific. I've done ten stage plays. I've done various adverts and in-house videos. Yeah. Um, I've done... 268 tellies because that there were lots of other series that you don't get over here and a lot of them were one was called my world one was stepping stones which we used to do about four a week which is for under fives yeah um basically quite a lot but since 1985 it just went on the shelf because i i had my daughter and i i worked Six weeks after she was born, I did Dempsey and Make Peace, and I went on working for about a year, and I went back to the Beeb to do Alice? Alice in Wonderland. And I just found, I kept looking at the clock. I thought, I'm not really, I just don't want to be here right now. And I stopped sort of going to Doctor Who conventions as well, because something really important had happened in my life. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't work and have children, I mean, I take my hat off to people. That's wonderful. If you can do that well, I couldn't do it well. I found that I was missing out on both things. And I didn't want, I mean, I really didn't want my work, not that I think, whatever I think of my work is my opinion, but I didn't want it to be less than my best, which it was. I was tired, and I wanted to be somewhere else. Not to put words in your mouth, but you feel you ended up neglecting both parts since you were trying well, to do just not, I just wasn't happy. I just didn't feel... It was just different. I had different priorities. So what I've done, um, I mean, I'm not saying I turned wonderful jobs down, but I turned work down because I didn't want to go away from home. I still don't really want to go away from home. Um, also, the changing climate in Britain, the recession has hit everyone. There is not as much work about. Now that I am a much freer agent, I mean, she is now 80 years old and her circle is widened and I can leave with friends and, you know, because my husband is an actor. So it wasn't like if I went away to work, he would always be there, or the grandparents would be there. He could be away. So the answer is, you either have a nanny full time, which I did for a year, and I ended up being out of work and paying the nanny, which is ridiculous. Uh, or you, you, you hire a different person every time, because you're not always going to get a series. You're going to do two days here, one day there, and you have to hire someone. So it's like leaving, I don't want to leave with strangers. Yeah. So that's the decision my family made, that that's how we would do it, and um, that's fine. You know, I would like to do more work now. More work is coming in, but um, I've passed a stage now. You know, it's a long time ago, 1985. We're now in, nearly in 1994. You're older, there are new people around, people forget. And, um, you know, the work is just not there. Uh, I, I mean, very recently, Doctor Who. That's what I'm doing again. I've done the radios, I've done Children in Need, I've done the 30 Years in the TARDIS. I've done a couple of adverts for Holland, um, some voices, and um, some corporate videos. Um, I think one for British Telecom. And, and then, you know, you work with really good people, but it's not, it's not really very high profile stuff. But it's, um, it's work. I hope there's more um, radios, because that's wonderful. I mean, we just all slip back again. Right, I mean, it's like no one had been away. It was, it was a very strange feeling. It was lovely. Is there talk of doing more of the audio? I think so. Well, you know, who, you, we've all been through this before. Yes, they <laughs> hope there is. It doesn't say it'll be me. It doesn't say it'll be John. There's always um, talk. <laughs> yes, there is. The channel, that the Radio 2 are showing it, that they're showing it at Christmas at the same time. Oh, yes, no, I, I did a Doctor Who um, chatting about it on radio, that they're putting it out at the same time as that. They like it. They would like there to be more. You know, <laughs> so would I, but it doesn't say that. 
with you, Sadie watching, sorry, with Sadie watching your videos and everything, does she want to become an actress? <laughs> she's too young. I wouldn't like yeah. her to. I mean, yeah, she's very into it at the moment because she's done a, a screen on one for the BBC. She's done an hour long, hour and a half long play drama. Mm -hmm. And she didn't get it. I mean, I don't know anybody. It's just that we went somewhere and someone saw her and they said, Would you ever let her audition? And I said, Well, I don't know. It would depend. All little girls of eight like to act. You know, that doesn't mean that. I, I don't want to say, This is what you're going to do. This is just something that she has actually done. She auditioned. She auditioned ages ago for something. And we thought it was for a little girl who danced around. Sadie and I do this thing of dancing the polka around in, in a pretty dress. And I said, OK, you can go up for it. She'd been up to three auditions, and it was not what we thought. It was the lead. It was about a little girl who died, so we didn't let her do that. And it, anyway, it fell through in the end. But the casting director remembered her. And she phoned up, and she said, could Sadie, um, would you let her audition for this part that I'm casting now? And um, other, a lot of other children were in it. And it was also done in the summer, out of doors, not in a studio. It was a lovely part. She was very, she got a wonderful notice in it. I mean, I'm terribly, ter I really am. I'm, I'm so proud of her because she'd never done anything before and she really handled it so well. So Sadie, in a long way around, Sadie thinks she would like to be an actress. But there's many other facets that I would like to show her, you know. Um, I don't like the kid who so. want to grow up to be the do the parents' job. Yes, I, 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 you know. Every kid wants she to She said the other day she, she's going to be a plumber or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but she was very good. She, she, I, I really am so proud of her. She got down to it and we were doing her lines at home. And she wouldn't start unless she said, action. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it was action. So she had great fun. and She was only off school for 12 days. Do you think that the role of Doctor Who has helped your career, or have you mm -hmm. encountered typecasting like some other actors have? I don't know, probably. But then I'm here because of Doctor Who. Other things have happened because of Doctor Who. Uh, I'm not in the market to knock it at all. Barry Lett said to me, I've just done something at the Royal Court, Stephen Poliakov's first play, before I went to audition. And accepted the role of Sarah. And um, during the first year, and he, quite a few times when I meet Barry, he said, Do you think I ruined your career? <laughs> but I, I, you know, thank God for Dr. Do you have the, let's say, special liking towards science fiction, or was Dr. Who just simply work, like you mentioned before? I, I, I never followed it as a fan or on a permanent basis. I caught the odd episode which I used, actually, because it was, it was very good. I remember if I saw one episode, and you just watched that one episode, it was really quite important to make that episode work on its own without knowing what had come before or what was coming after. So I, I, I sort of tried to remember that. Oops, the days when I was doing it. Uh, no, I, I, I'm not a great science fiction fan. I, I just like things that I like to watch that are good. I mean, it can be science fiction or... or not. I love thrillers. I... I Thrillers. I would love to be in a thriller. I love that. Um, I really, I, I really love that. Want to be the murderer or what? Mm, just, just because it's lovely to lie on camera. Uh, and it's very difficult. It's, it's like um, The Crucible. Quite a lot of people play Abigail as someone who is a villain, who is evil. And you should do it the other way. I love that juxtaposition. Um, I love that, um, are they on um, It's interesting, like, have you ever seen, like, Silence of the Lambs or something like that? God, I, I have to be strong. I want to see it, but, um, my husband worked with, um, on Pravda. Um, Anthony Hopkins did Pravda on stage, and when he did it on radio, my husband was in the company, and, um, he does this wonderful take of Anthony Hopkins. Years ago, he did a take. He's a wonderful mimic. And he did all these voices. Um, he was at the National for a long time. He did Richard Burton talking to Sir Lawrence Olivier, Richard Burton being Richard III, talking to Sir Lawrence Olivier being Henry V. He does this wonderful <laughs> And that take, he, he loves it. He, he did a recording, and he went all around different apps. He said, have you got the... Anthony Hopkins said, this is long before Signs of the Lambs. So we've got that one at home. And when he was doing Pravda, he went up to the soundboard and said, can I, can I make another tape? 
would that be all right? So there's this other wonderful take out now. Oh, it's, it, it is, I mean, it's just so good. No, I haven't seen Science of the Lambs. I don't feel strong enough. I don't, <laughs> I don't like crazy things. I will see it. The strange thing is, from what I saw, it's not gory, it's just suspenseful. Yes, it's, yeah. it's, it's, yes. My husband's consent, you wouldn't like it. <laughs> um, going back to the character of Sarah Jane, um, they uh, asked you to come back to do Canine and Company, um, where the doctor left Canine with Sarah Jane, um, and Sarah was a strong character in that. How did you uh, get that part, and was it ever going to be a series? I got that part because John Nathan Turner thought I could do it, and it was wonderful um, to be asked. You know, outside of Doctor Who. I came to it straight out of um, doing Gulliver. And I had one half day, and I went to see John, and I told him, and I saw the script date. Was it Eric Seward? I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah? He was one of them. And I said, I don't really, this isn't Sarah, I, I can't. Um, he said, oh, we'll, we'll make it work on, on location. It's okay, we've got this, that, and the other. They took five days away from us for filming. And um, I was trying to find Sarah in it, and I was trying to play it like her. No, I, I think she doesn't stand really as Sarah outside the doctor. I think she only works in that. I think I should have done something different with it. And there wasn't the time. And you see, if you if you're not given any time to really make mistakes on television, some um, programs are like um, you get the Good Life. Oh yes. Yeah. It's Wonderful really program. Very very good. I bet you don't remember the first series of The Good Life. No one in England does. No one in Oxford. That's not very good. By the time the second series came out, oh yes, they quite liked it. By the third series, it came out. Oh, that was their favourite. You, you've got time to make it better, to, to work on it. And, and there were things, you know, that I'm not here to say now, that I think, um, that I, I wasn't happy with, but I, I can't do anything but bless Nathan for actually asking me, for thinking I could do it, and for actually doing it in, in such um, an imaginative way. But I, I just think we needed better backup on it, really. Yeah, it's a shame. But was the BBC supportive at, at all of the thing into going into I don't series, think so. or no, it just got no. cut off before they? I, I don't think they were supportive of it at all, from what I hear. I don't think they were supportive of it before we even started it. From what I hear, I don't know Nathan. I mean, I'm just surprising Nathan would be the one to ask. Um, I thought it's wonderful to actually be asked. Were you insulted at all by the title? You know, Canine came first and you were just yeah. a company. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> <Bloody> cheap. <laughs> but then maybe he's more popular, I don't know. Everyone has an opinion. It was going to be called something else. Girl's Best Friend. That's the opposite title. Is it? That's yeah. what they use for the opposite title. Oh, they? Well, I don't know. No, I, I can't say um, that I, I, I thought that was going to be good. They still put me for it. Is it called Canine in town? Hmm? It's called K9 and Girl. K9 yeah. And then and the episode, the pilot episode is called The Girl's Best Friend. Oh, I think The Girl's Best Friend was a working title at one point. But you get first billing as far as uh, in the credits. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's only, oh, yeah. <laughs> I think John Leeson said one time about he did it, but he realized it was really going to be company in K9, just didn't call it that. <laughs>
Well, how about just characters on the, te uh, the television? Is there any? What I'd like to do now is, is do a sitcom. Mm -hmm. I did one Season after one. Doctor Who. Yes. Um, I love comedy. I love working for Alan Akeborn at Scarborough. We did a lot there. Um, and I think you do much better sitcoms than we do. I think you see our best ones, but mostly we try to emulate you. I think I mean, we just had a, a real Lulu in Britain who tried to do the Golden Girls, calling it Bright <laughs> Bells. Uh, yeah. They're all very, us. very good actresses, but it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And just to see, you know, the sitcoms that you have, it, they're so much slicker. Mm -hmm. they're ju they're, it's, I, I don't know if it's because you speak differently. It just works so much better. I mean, oh, there's this wonderful one I love of yours now, Gary Shandling. Um, oh, I've only Larry seen Sanders about show? yes, I've only seen about four. Rick Torn, and I think it's wonderful. You you have some, you know. I think sometimes English actors act. You have such amazing actors that are still wonderful actors, not 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 just um, personality actors, but who can actually just be so natural. I think it's wonderful. I would love to do a really good sitcom, or to be really really good in one. Um, I mean, you know, you have Roseanne, and oh, I think it's I think. Well, it, it's really a mistake for either country to copy a sitcom from the other, though. It rarely works. Several of them have, but... Yes, what, um, the one with Warren Mitchell that Carol Connor did. Uh, yeah, that, 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 yeah. That, yes. But they tried to do Faulty were. Towers, and that was did awful. Oh, and several others that have been awful, and, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Well, two, two reasons not to get off the subject is because Faulty Towers and also the Fallen Rise original parent came before they tried to do the remakes, and... They were they separate so they have seen the original. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yes, 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 exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they pick out all the, 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 the xenophobia and all the, the really nasty stuff that Walking Towers are really cleaning up. I mean, you know, there's not much left. <laughs> well, John, John Cleese once said that the biggest difference between a British and American sitcom is that American sitcoms have so many bloody kids in them. Where, where every, <laughs> most of our sitcoms have little kids. Yes, you do have yeah. I soap. It works sometimes. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I mean, I watched it for the first time. I thought, I can't believe what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. But that was really very upfront for America, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. It was Didn't very controversial when it first came out. I saw a recording. I was in Los Angeles in my first American convention, and we went, um, we went to see a recording. And at the time, um, have you heard of Terry Wogan? He, is, um, oh, yeah, yeah. He, he was a radio personality. He's now a television personality. So he had this very, very popular radio show. And he latches on to things. You know, like most popular personalities, and sort of knocks them, you know, with humour. And you know, everyone's listening for the next day. What's he going to say? And he did this with Dallas, and he actually did it with um, with soap. And his big kick was that he called. Um, oh no, it was while soap and Dallas. He called Lucy Ewing the poisoned wolf or something. <laughs> and I was talking to this agent of soap, and I, I mentioned this and said, "Well, actually, I'm her agent," <laughs> which is rather embarrassing. <laughs> Oh, but it was wonderful. But you're very much, uh, I mean, on, on the floor, so two people got into bed together and you put the screens around them while they got into bed. And I thought there was some gag under the bed. But evidently this is what they do, just for propriety, well, they did. They put screens around and uh, Richard Mulligan and whoever it was, his wife, they got into bed, they did the thought there's some gag here. And I, I didn't understand it when nothing happened. Um, I mean, we wouldn't do that. Well, I think Americans are more uptight about sexuality, especially on mm. television. I mean, on the other hand, the British are more restrictive on but violence. But not in films. So. Mm. Yes, you're very um, uptight on television, but not really in films. Yeah. Yes. When your husband um, comes with you to these conventions and everything, does he ever have his own panel? Or does he give Brian. autographs for anything? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, it's, it's, if we come now as a family, you, you, you can't actually be playing two roles. I mean, I'm here with my husband and with my daughter because we, it's nice to travel together. This is an experience for her. She's in downtown Chicago now. I mean, it's wonderful for her. Um, you can't be involved with the convention and look after her. So um, he has been to conventions um, without me. I mean, it works better that way. <coughs> You don't want two of you getting in the bedroom at night. <laughs> I'm tired. You know, it's just, it's just better. I mean, I, I think um, 
he, he did an interview with Kevin, didn't he? <coughs> yes. Yesterday. Yes, I mean, yes, he's, he's very willing in that, but it's nice to just keep it separate. Mm -hmm. um, he, he never worked on Doctor Who when I was in it, which is a shame. He did the Dalek voices after, and then he was in Snake Dance, wasn't he? But um, we worked together a, a great deal. We worked together for three years in Manchester, um, which was which was wonderful. But we we haven't worked a great deal since. Oh yes, we did. We did a two-hand and one used caravan and we did, um, we did, um, that was awful. Americans should do that. was written by, was it William Goldman? Yeah. Um, it, it's very, it should be done by an American cast. I mean, I don't think we did it very well. Is that your one? Hmm? What's that? Don't say anything about it. Oh, my. Don't say anything. Just a bomb. Don't worry. Um, and we did, um, we did a play together on television, an hour-long play, playing husband and wife. But we were cast separately, and the director had the abducts. He said, what? You're married? But he said, your relationship's falling apart, and I said, don't worry, Did you do an advert with, with Ian? I Warner, did. That you were husband and wife? I didn't know it was Ian until I got on the set and we got told off so much because <laughs> he couldn't stop talking. <laughs> Slave! And he said, what are you doing here? And Ian has this thing um, about out-of-breath acting, because I was usually running on corridors. Before I do a take it, OBB acting, Slayton, OBB, out of breath. So all through this advert for the Daily Mail or whatever it is, are you out of breath in this? Are you out of breath? <laughs> Could I ask a little um, bit more about the uh, Paradise of Death that you did, mm -hmm. the recording? Um, can you just sort of give a little bit about what it's about without giving the play away? <laughs> I remember. Um, can I use this? Um, well, yes, Sarah and the Doctor meet up. Um, Sarah is again a, a, a journalist, and she is um, going somewhere. Her editor sends her. Um, <coughs> the Doctor is there, and um, we sort of take off into space. And horrible things happen to me, much worse than ever happened on the screen. Because you're allowed to do a great deal more, I think, on radio. Barry oh, Letts said, I would never have got away, or I could never have got away. I've never written of this. Well, um, for, 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 for screen. Uh, some of that stuff with Peter Miles. And yes, it's really, it, it's, it's quite... Peter um, Miles plays a real nasty, you know, surging and has mercy for a while there, and it's just, mm. I don't even want to look at for... It's, it's, all, it's all terribly physical, which is ever so funny when you've got a script <laughs> in your hands. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, Did you all work you together to record it, mm. together in the studio? Yeah. So that you could re interact with each other? Oh, yeah. I mean, you're, you're sitting up in, 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 you know, a green room, and you're called for a scene, and whoever's participating in that scene goes down, and you all go around the mic, and you don't have any rehearsal. I mean, radio is not easy. You, you have a read-through upstairs. Now, if you have a read-through for television, you go home and you work on it that night, because you might have worked on it a, 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 on your own at home, but you've left no room for what the other actor's going to do, and you think, oh, I'm having trouble with this, and then someone else will read it, the part that you've been reading in your head at home, and it'll just work because of what they do. It's all interacting. But that only comes to you upstairs, you know, in an hour before you maybe, or ten minutes before you go down and do it. You have to be ready to just get it together very, very quickly, even though you don't have to learn the lines. You have to know really what's coming. And, and there's a lot of technicality involved. I mean, it's, I mean, to see actors being either very emotional or very funny, and then quickly, very carefully turning the pages. <laughs> because if it rustles, you know, and you're very close to the mic, they have to stop and start again. And then you're turning back, and you're all trying to um, either be close on mic or be back or turn away. Um, you know, there's, 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 there's this technique to it. Are you doing any physical stuff when you're doing that? Yeah. Or are you just standing there? Well, some <clears throat> sometimes the physical stuff is done for you because if you're meant to drop a tray of crockery mm -hmm. and do your lines at the same mm -hmm. time, you can't fall on the floor. So, wonderful, wonderful Colin was there. We had the best. He, he was fantastic. Colin Guthrie. He should be here at this convention. He was <coughs> wonderful. The, I actually saw him, the crockery went up in the air, he did a great flip with his legs on the floor. You know, no one will ever see it, but that's the sound. But Peter and I had to do um, physical things and with the script, because you can't time it sometimes if someone's grabbing hold of your wrist and having a fight, and, mm -hmm. um, and that is very difficult. Do you know we're actually wrestling because at some point in there? the distance between you in reality might be more or less, mm -hmm. but you can't um, yeah. be too, you still have to be on mic. So you have to time it. Um, I think it was in episode four. It was quite difficult. It's with Peter and I. Are you just doing it a count, or are you, are you, are you actually wrestling with each other at all? Really no, bad? no. You have to actually do the words and fit in whatever you have to do mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
And it's about taking off to this um, out of space thing. And um, I suppose it's maybe a little like Jurassic Park or something. Had you done um, radio or audio only before? I know you did that Doctor Who in the Pescatons no, a long time ago. No, I did radio back in before I ever did Doctor Who because working at Manchester, we didn't used to work for Sunday. We'd work all through Saturday and perform Saturday matinee, Saturday evening, and then do Sunday free. And um, they have a program over Leeds, which is not big, it's about an hour away from Manchester by train, called Northern Drift. And that's where I met um, Alan Akeborn. He was writing for Northern Drift then, and um, Henry Livings, Alfred Bradley. And we would go and do plays there on the Sunday, if, you know, we were asked, or sketches. I love doing, I love doing, um, I'm, not, I'm not a lead heroine, I'm a character. I always have been. I played menopausal women when I was 22. <laughs> Why they would let me play them now? <laughs> I love playing um, these bitchy older older ladies, and I Jackson used to get the chance really to do it on radio, which is wonderful. Because for visual things, you know, sort of play as well. <clears throat> so you you uh, develop sort of that kind of persona voice, um, or something like that. Well, you you, you play around with accents. I. Oh, yes, I'm going to do so. I've never done a, a, a variety thing before. I'm, I'm not a, you know, I don't, I can't sing in there, I would love to be able to sing. You know, and I, I, John Woodvine is in here, John Woodnut Wallace, so I'm not going to do a tap dance. So I'm just going to read some poetry, but it's Liverpool poetry. I love doing accents. I love, um, I'm from the North, and um, it was lovely to play around with accents. And uh, we Scots one. I remember playing a Scottish midwife. And, you know, there's the, there she is in the book, a flat 50s Scottish midwife. And it's lovely to do that. And very soft and lovely. Who's a fine boy then? Fat boy. Uh, it was, it's wonderful to kind of hide behind all these, these layers. I love it. I would love to do more radio. I really would. But they have in London now the radio rep. And you have to do lots of audition on the ground on it for two years. And I don't think I'm as versatile to do what they ask of there. Because, um, you know, they say, come in like tomorrow and with your Northern Ireland, not your Southern, your Northern. And I don't, you know, I don't know if I'm that specific to do that. I'm okay up North and a few others, but um, I'd have to have more practice. So you can get a wonderful portrait of, you know, Beatles accent or something similar. You have to wait for that. Okay. Yeah. Surprise. Well, it's all I've got. I'm not preempting it now. Okay. <laughs> I'm okay. not looking forward to it anyway. I wasn't asking you to do that. Was just oh, you're not. Well, there are very many different Liverpool accents. Mm -hmm. There's, um, do you know Stella Black? I no, know who she, she is. Um, well, there's, there's your posh Liverpool, there's your Dockers Liverpool, there's your Irish Liverpool. Um, there's, there's, there's quite a, a, a number. I, I've never had a very strong Liverpool accent. I have a, a very Liverpool intonation. It's very sing-songy. And only across, you know, the Irish Sea from Liverpool is Ireland, so there's a great Irish contingency in Liverpool. So it is very lilty. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I never had, a, I don't, my parents didn't either, I mean, my father's from Devon, so he, he had a slight temperature Liverpool accent, which is quite strange. And my mother's from Liverpool, but um, she just has a Liverpool personality, she's very funny, they say you have to be a comedian to live there. <laughs> Maybe that's why I got on so well with Tom. <laughs> he's from Liverpool, and um, he's very nice. You uh, did, uh, did you have any difficulty with your costumes? at all. Uh, get tripped up by them, have, have things? No, just the scarf. I used to much by the scarf. I mean, sometimes the trousers were a bit tight. I used to think they were a bit tight sometimes. I remember on dinosaurs. A, uh, I was breathing in. And said, oh, God. Yeah, she said it fits perfectly, perfect. I said, it's tight. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. How about the uh, Curtis Morris dress, the long white one? That was nice to wear. It was I, a beautiful I, dress, yeah. I, um, I did a, I, I, I'm, I'm quite happy in period costume because I did quite a lot in the theatre. It doesn't kind of get in my way. I don't mind it. What is nice is to actually use it. Some people, um, I think, are put in a period thing and all of a sudden they think, um, I mean, you have to be different because your undergarments are different. You know, you can't actually move somewhere. But, but people still like to be comfortable and use it. And I think, you know, it's, it's a mistake to wear something period and think, I must not touch it. 
you know, people used it. They sat down and they used the material. Mm -hmm. I, I like using period and stuff. We did that a lot in Gulliver. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. yeah. wonderful the the director for periods. That's one of her memories of you. She'd always say, be careful with the dress that you're getting in one age. So the heck with it. I'm going to come. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what she says anyway. Yes. Penny Russell. Oh, right. Who's to come again? I was always saying, be careful with the dress. No, she was always saying, be careful with the dress list, you're getting it muddy. Oh, yes. Since the heck with that, I want to be comfortable. Yeah. Oh, yes, you have to, um... Oh, good for me. I'm glad I said <laughs> <laughs> I didn't remember that. I'm, I'm really glad I said Speaking of Gulliver, could you tell a little bit about what part that was and... It's um, wonderful. She was a flirt. She was absolutely two-timing everyone. I had the most wonderful clothes to wear. It was written for me. She is in Jonathan Swift's books, but she has a very minor role. Mm -hmm. And Barry Lett said, um, if you'll say you'll play it, he said, I will write it for you. I promise I will write it up. It was wonderful. I don't know why. The BBC have shown everything again in that slot except Gulliver. People would come in the studios just look at the costume and say, are you doing an opera? I mean, everything. You know, you hear how out on films they have all the genuine lace and... Oh, God, it was wonderful. And then it just was on the once and never repeated. They're showing that in the video room here. Are they? Yes, I told them well, I recorded it when it was on the arts channel. Did you enjoy it? Here. Yes, very did you, much. Did you? I'm ever so glad. I'm, I, I really, we all worked so hard on that. It was wonderful. I loved it to bits. I really, really did. And it was, no, that's indulgent. Don't but <laughs> could you just say, though, what was the part? Just She to, was to a two-timey little flirt. She was a very high-born lady and um, married to an older husband and got very bored, you know, and, and so had women friends and that and was absolutely loved intrigue and gossip because there was nothing else to do. I mean women in that era, era they had no purpose except to be decorative and she wanted more. And she falls in love with Gulliver. She falls in love. She sees this thing. And that's the first true feeling that she actually has. And it's it, it, she questions everything that has ever gone on in her life before. And everything else is meaningless. It's, it's we had terrible trouble. We, we had we had either a go slow or, or, or problems and things. We couldn't. Um, it took so long to set up. I remember sitting around practically all day in these in these in these courses, and we, we couldn't eat. I, I couldn't get out of it at lunchtime because I couldn't get back in it again. <laughs> and I remember I had a hard boiled egg, and I thought I would eaten a bloody chicken. <laughs> I, was, I really, everyone was very, very. I mean, they really were very particular, and you wanted to look good, so you thought, well, I won't eat. And we would be there from God knows what time we were in there in the morning, eight in the morning, maybe nine in the morning till ten at night. And, oh, God, you know, whatever else to call this came up. <laughs> but Barry couldn't get, um, at one point I should have stepped in his hand and couldn't get, so he just blow. I, I could hear him shouting things down. And the, the cameraman, someone came on the floor and said, right, just stop. And Barry said, well, I'll have to go see so-and-so, so-and-so. And the head cameraman said, no, it's all right, come with me. And he took this fellow, we'll go and see him together, whoever the head man was. And while he took me away, we filmed some more. The crew were wonderful. We, we just wouldn't have got it in otherwise. It was a labor of love. It was absolutely, I was really so pleased to have worked on it. Up until recently, if you could get it on video over here. You can. I've seen it in catalogs, yeah. Oh, right. Oh, we can't. I don't know why, but I've seen it. Yeah. They just found a, uh, a series that they had been missing, or the BBC had been missing after the Sci-Fi Channel showed it on the... So it's like, oh, we, we, we lost that. We were looking for it. <laughs> That's because they forgot that it was an American co-production and the American company would have had copies. They just didn't know. But this really tape selling a product. I believe so, yeah. I think I saw the catalog not that long ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's still around. Yeah. 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 You want a copy? <laughs> no, I just like to get paid for it. That's all. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> well, people make money out of me. Why not? I'm gracious. I don't do anything. In September, there was a Panopticon celebration in England. There was, yes. That you attended with yes, I did. everyone else. How was that, seeing everyone? It was lovely. I saw Tom again, yeah. which was brilliant. I didn't know if he would be there or not. I did my bit on stage. And um, I came up, and I was walking down the stairs. So I was high up, and he was quite low down. And he looked up out of it. It's really lovely to see him. He enjoyed himself. He looked very well. 
People talk about how eccentric Tom Baker was. What was your first impression when you first met him when you were on the series? I thought he looked very good. I thought he was a very good physical choice. And I just wanted to be friends with him. But to have a good working relationship it was very difficult because the moment he came on, this, on the set was to lie down, to be transformed when John goes. And John was quite emotional at that point because he was playing, dying. It was quite a freeze on, on, on the set and Tom walked into it and other than, I don't even know if we said hello, I know I'd been introduced to him at some point, but you couldn't get in the way then, you had to do it, you know, and it was, you just leave everyone alone at a time, like that, you know, you just do what you had to do. And then he went away and we carried on with what we had to do. And, um, you know, I just wondered, I just thought, oh, you know, I, I really hope it all works well, and I, I'm just so delighted that I had the chance of, to be an assistant to Tom's doctor. He gave me so much. It's wonderful to work with. Was he support, very supportive of the other Incredibly. actors? Incredibly. Wonderfully. He was never, ever just thinking of himself as the doctor. That's why it was so good. He used to say, now look, Liz is looking stupid here. This makes me look stupid. I wouldn't take someone stupid in space with me. Very good sense, isn't it? This makes me. But it, it's, it's wonderful. Um, oh yes, I mean he um, he is very much a, a characterful man, and um, I think his eccentricity is a great fun to him. I think he enjoys playing his eccentricities. Um, we used to have a schedule where sometimes you'd have to get fitted for the next si um, story's costumes while we were working on this one. And Tom used to say wonderful thing like, he said, go away. He said, I can't be fitted for, for a new whatever it is. He said, I'm saving the universe. Go away. <laughs> in a great humor, which shows in the, in the program, I think. The uh, relationship changed, too, because when we were looking at the John Perfect Doctor, it's more of a kind of a father figure to a daughter. That's right. And then with Tom Baker, you were much closer in, in physical age. And what do you mean? We had that kind of shift where it almost seemed like there was kind of romantic element. Oh, no, you never had Well, I mean, not, not that way, but no, still No, it was just, it was, it, well, yes, the age difference probably um, shows itself even if you don't notice movies. it. Mm -hmm. But it was, um, I mean, he... Yes, John, John is, like I said before, the cloak around the trick. He's protective. He's the dandy doctor. And Tom, um, I mean, it's just very different. It, it allowed my character to change, which was, which was wonderful. It gave me more options to play with. And, you know, you know, you have someone you really care about, someone who's a best friend. And you operate on, on well, that. Well, I guess I'm thinking, like, especially in Hand of Fear towards the end, the handy <laughs> handy outfit. I guess it was more, wicked, isn't it? it was kind of keeping this Sarah Jane is, is younger, or at least uh, keeping it more like the Doctor is an older character and uh, Sarah Jane is the younger yes, it character. it did come out that way. I only saw that episode, four episodes, about a month ago, because I, a fan sent me them, because a panoptic and I said I'd never seen it, because I was working in Liverpool, and I didn't have, I mean, didn't have tape record, you know, a record machine then. And I was doing the matinee at five o'clock when it went out, so I never saw it. And I, I'd never gone out of my way to see it since. And we no, wrote a lot of the last scene ourselves. And I remember telling Sadie at one point, they didn't let us film the last scene as the very last scene. We did it in the first lot of recording. I don't know if that was because they didn't want to, they thought, oh, well, maybe we better not make it the last scene. They'll, they'll get too mushy or something. It would be <laughs> wrong. I don't know. But what did happen was, one of the scenes that we filmed in the last recording was the one with Eldrad, where Eldrad cannot get up some sort of slope. And Tom and I just had a funny moment, and we got the giggles. Whether it was a release of tension, the last scene had way gone in the first load of episode, and there was sort of just, I, I don't know what it was, there just came a point, and we were slipping and sliding. We actually genuinely fell down at one point, and then we started to do it again and again. Again. And they were going mad in the box. <laughs> can, you, can you just, what are, they, what are they doing on the floor? I could hear it through the phones. Well, we just tell them to go. And Judy Paris, who was a friend of mine, was playing Eldrad. And I remember her just standing there. I had a big doing. I mean, I'm stuck here in this coffee. I can remember it. So and Tom and I were just in fits. We were just walking up the slope. And slapping down. It's wonderful. It was just a kind of maybe 
release party attitude or I don't know what it was. It, it was um, it was great. It was more fun than sentimental, is what you were saying? Yes. Yes, because <clears throat> yes, you just had to have a release of emotion somewhere because I did miss him. And I, I hope, you know, he, he, he missed me and it was it was the end of something that had actually worked very well. So whatever was mounting that day let itself off in in that way. And I, I just remember it seemed to go on for a very, very long time. Was it your choice? Has this gone on for a very, very long time? <laughs> yeah, we get cut. <laughs> yeah. Thank you ever so much. I wanted to ask you if, uh, because, you know, Fans do a lot of things that um, yeah. on their own as well as you know, help yourself, folks. going to conventions. Yeah. And one of the things that we do is we often write our own stories about the show. Yes. And Sarah Jane fe is featured a lot in Doctor Who fan fiction. I mean, Kevin does an entire zine just about. I don't know how he done it. Where, where Kevin has got the clips from? All the things that things that I've done. I think the stuff is very well. Well, I was just thinking about the the, fa the fiction based on Sarah Jane. Do you read any of it? Have you? Ever seen stories that people write about your character? And what do you think? Uh, because we very often write as if, you know, they're usually Sarah Jane without the doctor, you know, on her own. I think some of them are very funny. I think they're very amusing, actually. I think they're very imaginable. You know? They're very good. They're just not publishable in the real world, but hey. I'm sorry, it's in the readers. I wonder if she's Her illustrations are wonderful. I've never met really. So I just want, I just want because, you know, a lot of actors, you know, fans send them the zines, and we don't know if they actually, you know, if they actually read them or if they just pile up, you know, on a dusty shelf somewhere. And I was just wondering if you had read it. and if not for anyone else. I tell you, he does read for my husband. He doesn't let me not read them. I never know what's going on. I always read them. And then he's done. When he goes to the bookshop, and he looks in the back and tells me what I've been Oh, I had another question, because... They're going to start doing a series of novels in England now based on the earlier Doctors, not just the current one. And, uh, I do apologize. I've got to go to do... Okay. No, 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 I'm fine. Many and thanks for having invited me. Yeah. That was a treat for me. I played with it. Just to finish my question. One of the early novels that's going to be written is going to feature uh, the Fourth Doctor and Sarah Jane. I was wondering if you knew anything, if they had told you about this. No. Because oh. John Peel, who's here, is going to be writing, writing a, do a novel with you and the Fourth Doctor set in Victorian England. With the, with the Fourth Doctor? The Fourth Doctor and Sarah Jane, yeah. I'll make you stop. Oh, I didn't know It's going to be uh, where Sarah Jane asks the Doctor to take her back so she can meet Roger Kipling. You said something to me, but I didn't realize that it was... And that'll be published either next year or in 1995. Yeah, original. Oh, I thought maybe. said he's going to mention things in it that H.G. Wells and. I thought maybe he he you knew about it. I didn't until I mean it's only at this moment. Yeah. To be perfectly honest, I haven't chatted to. I haven't been around when I'm in in the the green room. I think there's something to sign, or I'm on my way somewhere. And it probably won't be until.
director, Gary Lett, you listening intently. And I remember when I did see with Peter Miles, it had to be very fast for radio. When you do the stage or the television, you do your work at home and the script is you do as much as you can. You can't do a great deal until you meet the other actors to see where they're going to be. And something that you think doesn't work, when they actually say the line to you, it works because of the way they do it. So you have time to go home, and that's in your mind for when you come again the next day to rehearse it. On radio, you have a reading in the morning, you just go right through the script. And no one really sort of, it, it is really for timing for the assistant to see how long, you know, each scene takes. So you don't need to think of how they were doing it. But then you have to go down in 10 seconds whenever it is your first scene up and do it. So you have to assimilate very, very quickly what they have got to their character to how you need to play your So you, there, are things, there are all sorts of various levels of things going on in your mind. And also the technicality of it. It doesn't matter how good you are at mic. If they hear a crinkle of paper, when you turn it over, you have to do it all again. The technicality of the physical limitations of radio are very different. Um, and there was a scene with Peter Miles, and it worked. It, it actually worked very, very well. And it wasn't written to do anything at the end. And when it was over, it was half of me that said, I should carry this scene on, I should actually cry in a certain way. I can't do it now. It's a good, good scene. And then I thought, oh God, this was a good take. If I do that, would I ruin it? And all these things were going on. And I, I went for it, and I thought, it could be too much, maybe it's not. And, 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 I, and I, I, I did it very disjointed at the end, and then I looked up to Fox, and Barry was going, like, <laughs> so you have to be, there's a certain part you have to be brave and go for it, and the other time you pull back and no, I'm wrong and, and you have to make instant, instant decisions. Yes, we could have done it again, with a in shape, it's maybe a few things too.
when the program started, there was not one or two, but a full three companions. And the originators of the show in some of the annuals, fan books, uh, have claimed that the idea behind this was to have one for everyone in the family to identify with. But then you were on, uh, sometimes you had Harry, sometimes you had K-9, on rare occasions you may no, used to be alone. Never you never did. That's no, only in the, the... That's right. Yeah. Um, but uh, how does it differ being carrying the companion role more or less alone versus part of a three-person team? And would you have preferred a larger team? Or what kind of difference does it make? It was lovely to have it in. Um, I was wondering about some of the, the little bits that occurred at the end of some of your episodes, the, the humorous interplay between you and Tom Baker particularly. And I was wondering, you know, like at the end of um, Terror of the Zygons where you're discussing how you're going to get back to London, yeah. or at the end of uh, Android Invasion when Sarah wants to, you know, to go home and take a taxi and the doctor says that he'll take you home. And you just that interplay, was that scripted or ad-libbed or how did that... I can't honestly remember okay. those particular ones, but I know one I can remember, not dialogue. Because when you work with someone closely for a long time, you know them very well. Things, you know, just fit together better somehow than what's on the page. Um, and there's one in now to work the Mars. Usually by the time you get on the studio floor, you don't hold the thing because there's no time for it, for, for, for improvisation or anything. Um, but um, Tom was always gay. <laughs> respond to about Sarah Jane was you know her, her cheerfulness and her sense of humor, which yeah. very few moments only did she ever lose, and I think that was yeah. one of the things that makes her you know 
so popular. And I was just wondering how much of that was scripted and how much of that was uh, was your contribution. Well, there's no right way to ever say a lie. It's just actors and how they say. So there's loads of ways of saying a page of dialogue and the suggestions from the director. And quite a lot of it, especially in this kind of material, is really up to you. Um, and I, I had a very clear idea of what I wanted to do with them. Whether other people would like it, I didn't know. But I just, I, I, I just felt that, um, you know, if she was going to be around with the doctor, travel around, she couldn't be a wet blanket. You know, she was there, she had to be there because she wanted to be there. Why did she want to be there? Because she found it interesting, she found it energizing, she liked the doctor, he was her <coughs> best friend, she was incredibly emotionally attached to him in that respect. She would care if he hurt himself, and maybe there was part of him that needed mothering, or whatever. I just tried to get as many ideas <coughs> of why I was staying there in my mind, and then put that to one side and then just do it. <coughs> Oh, well, we didn't record. Do you, do you mean in the recording time? We did right. that in the first row. They wouldn't let us do it in the last row. I think they didn't trust us. I don't think they were going to do it in years. I don't know. Um, did I work with it? I saw him recently at an Optimum, but I've never done professional jobs since. That was your question. Well, I meant in that story. <coughs> oh, no. Oh, no. I certainly mean, no. Right. No, it wasn't. Um, we did that, um, we used to have um, four studio days, two together, and then rehearse again, and then two together. But it quite often wasn't episode one or two, and then episode three and four, because sometimes the logistics of getting the set, uh, you had to do all the corridor scenes together, because there wouldn't be enough studio in space, so all the corridor scenes from one, two, three, and four would have to be done in whatever stop they said. So quite often they were recording out of order. Ian had this lovely thing about it. It was a corridor scene. Is this an old big scene? He's out of breath. We just stand there panting. Old big slave. Because you had about three inches, you know, before you were on camera. It was so short of space. Um, that's right. Yeah. And um, so Tom and I did that scene. And we wrote a lot of it ourselves, actually. Um, it was very nice that they let us. I've seen the original game. version of, of the script, the, the final scene. I gave that away, I'll tell you. It was, it was a good flat. thing you changed it. It was very flat. flat. It, it wasn't bored. It wasn't yeah, it so wasn't awful. Bored. It just was just it just wasn't anything. It, was it didn't have nearly the emotion of it. No, that's um, no, I don't know. Okay. So we did that in the first offer, and we just we just did it. It wasn't any particular. I guess you were aware the last time gosh that would come out at the end of the sort of part So we had um we had a lot of bell drag in the very last time I was like, and there was one particular scene where Tom and I held her up. I think she must have been hurt in some way, but not drastically hurt. I, I forget, we had to carry her quite a bit and pump her over. And, um, yeah. and there was this slope that we had to sort of crawl up. And accidentally, when Tom and I first went up, we slipped, we slipped back. And we just and we kept doing it. And it got quite numb. It got very, very silly. Um, I think it was, because it was the last one, it was sort of a release of emotional tension, or whatever you want to call it. You know. um, we knew this is the last time, this wasn't exactly the last scene, but this is the last time we were still in the And we kept crawling up the stairs. We were in his stairs. It wasn't funny, but it was funny to us. Tom, when he laughs, he really laughs, he's killing his own. And Judy Paris, who's a friend of mine, who's playing Elder, I can see her standing there, and I'm like, I'm stuck here in this costume. <laughs> <laughs> and and they, they had to tell Tom, Liz, could, could, you, could you please get on with it? Oh, we couldn't. I don't know, it felt like forever, and it's as though we didn't want it to stop. We were just laughing and laughing and laughing. How long?
long before the convention did you arrive to accustom yourself to the time difference, if at all? And has the convention been taking good care of you <laughs> and your family? The visuals people really know what they're doing. I've been here enough to see that. And if there's one thing they know how to do right, it's take care of the guests. They're, they're organized, but they're so nice with it. You know sometimes you've got to be rushed around a bit. But I haven't felt rushed. I haven't done it. Um, well, I think they've been smashing. I can't remember when I came. I came Tuesday. Oh, when it I haven't seen fresh air. I should have actually gone, yes, Wednesday. I should have actually gone out on Thursday, but Sadie wanted to swim in the pool, and by the time I got her hair washed and dry, and she thought, I'm not staying now. I think if I'd been on my own, I would have gone out and climbed and climbed myself, because they said, if you don't get rid of the jet lag, it's see daylight, you have to have a lot of daylight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here at Thomas was here last year, yeah. we came out Monday morning. What will you be doing in the new uh, variety show tonight? Yeah. Uh, he was here in Philadelphia, and he came in. Yeah. Yeah. 
This is going to be really wonderful. Uh, someone you've enjoyed. You can see the two different heights of the microphone. I'm going to introduce a most original act now. Would you please introduce the lovely Elizabeth Sladen and her daughter, Sadie, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know where... No. No. Um, I don't... I don't think you're meant to be here yet, Sadie. I think it's me first. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, right. But you can stay if you like, but you might see more if you're out front. Okay. Just a little hiccup in the arrangements. Thank you. When I was asked to come to Chicago, I thought, well, why am I really here? I'm here because of Sarah Jane. Who is Sarah Jane? Sarah Jane is me, Liz Sladen. I come from Liverpool. Now, Tom Baker comes from Liverpool. Maybe that's why we got on so well Paper together. Back. Hello, Tom? Tom? You there? <laughs> I think that was meant to be a bit of um, Paul McCartney, not sure. It should have brought me on. So I, um, I thought maybe that's why we've got the same sense of humor when we get on so well together. Um, other than that, I would like to read you some Liverpool poetry. But before I do, I'd better tell you a little bit about the Liverpool accent. They say that you have to be a comedian to live in Liverpool. There's loads of Liverpool accents. There's Irish Liverpool, there is middle class Liverpool, there is Dockers Liverpool, and there's posh Liverpool. When I went to school, we used to have on a Friday afternoon an elocution teacher come to say hello to us and teach us. And um, she used to have a little poem that she had a say. So we used to stand up in groups of five. There'd be myself, Susan Turner, Sheila Firkin, Jean McCrimmon. And she used to say, Claire has fair hair. Mary's hair is red. Mary wishes her hair was fair, like Claire's instead. So Sheila Firkin, Elizabeth Slade, and Susan Turner, we used to stand up and we used to say, Clara's fair hair, Mary's hair is red. Mary wishes her hair was fair like Claire's instead. <laughs> Did you understand that? Sort of. Right. Well, there are two Liverpool poets that I like, Adrian Henry and Roger McGough. Now, Roger McGough used to be known, before he was a poet, as a member of The Scaffold, which was um, a pop group in Liverpool that Mike McGeer belonged to. Yeah that uh, he's Paul McCartney's brother. And I thought, um, well, how can I make this sort of part of America? And I found this one by Roger McGough, and it's called Good Bat Nightman, and it's about Batman and Robin. So plug your luggles back, and away we go, if I can see it in this light. God bless all policemen and fighters of crime. May thieves go to jail for a very long time. They've had a hard day helping clean up the town. Now they hang from the mantelpiece both upside down. A glass of warm blood and then straight up the stairs, Batman and Robin are saying their prayers. They've locked all the doors and they've put out the bat, put on bat jammers, they like doing that. They've filled their bat water bottles, made their bat beds with two springy battresses for sleepy bat heads. Their closing red eyes and their counting black sheep, Batman and Robin, are falling asleep. Right. Well, the next one is um, from Adrian Henry, and he's talking after Christmas blues. When I woke up this morning, it was Christmas Day, and the birds were singing the night away. I saw Miss Stocking lying on the chair, looked right to the bottom. But you weren't there. There was apples, oranges, chocolates, aftershave, but no you. So I went downstairs, and the dinner was fine. 
There was pudding and turkey and lots of wine. And I pulled those crackers with a laughing face till I saw there was no one in your place. There was mince pies, brandy, nuts and raisins, mashed potatoes, but no you. Now it's New Year's Eve and it's Old Lang Syne and it's 12 o'clock and I'm feeling fine. Should old acquaintance be forgot? I don't know, girl, but it hurts a lot. There was whiskey, vodka, dry martini, stirred but not shaken. And 12 New Year resolutions, all of them about you. So it's all the best for the year ahead as I stagger upstairs and into my bed. Then I looked at the pillar by my side and I tell you, baby, I almost cried. There was autumn, summer, spring and winter and all of them without you. Right. <laughs> You're very kind. And there's a little one here, not by um, a Liverpool poet, but it, it's quite nice and I, I like to end on this. This is it, and I am it. And you are it, and so is that. And he is it, and she is it, and it is it. And that is that. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I've got a little person down in the audience who you all saw before who would love to be part of this. So, Sadie, if you'd like to come up on stage now. This was her idea, not mine. Um, there's a little microphone for you here. Okay. Have you got your sweeties? Oh, get your sweeties. All right, I'll hold those. Ah, and to keep it in the family, Sadie's going to say a poem that they learned at school. Yeah. Let's speak up. This poem is called, Oh, I Wish I'd Looked After My Teeth. And it's by Panez. Oh, I wish I'd looked after my teeth And spotted the perils beneath All the toffees I chewed And the sweet sticky food Oh, I wish I'd looked after my teeth So I lay in the old dentist's chair And I gazed up his nose in despair <laughs> And his drillet do wine in these molars of mine To amalgam He'd say, for him there. Well, okay. <laughs> what do you want to do with this? Now, since my poem was about teeth, I've brought this little pink cup, and some this sweets. little cup contains some sweets. And I'm going. And if you are lucky, you may catch one. Okay. And another one this side. Hurry it up now. Throw it out. They're all waiting. One, two. More? Other more? What happened to your hairband that I took ages putting on? Oh. Ow! <laughs> Any more? Okay. Okay now. I think it's bedtime now. Thank you very much. Come on. One. Ladies and gentlemen, Elizabeth and Sadie Slater. Sexism. Yeah, we just don't get enough work. <laughs> yeah, there are always more all parts for men. There's always anyway. those men are working. And we just don't have the same amount of, especially if you're over a certain age. Exactly, yeah. Dolly birds, yeah, sure. It were. Once you're past the dolly stage, it's not so easy. I don't think it's quite the same in America. They seem to, you seem to cast older women or in more glamorous roles than they do in England. They don't understand us. <laughs> <laughs> they therefore don't write for us. I Why think are we more women writers. Yeah, I think I we're slowly, ca we're always behind, aren't we? The, the, the movements in the States, we eventually start to catch up a bit. Yeah. I smack her body. Yeah. Um, no, I think every eight-year-old, um, they, they just, you know, if they like people, they, it's, a, it's a form of showing off. Um, she has done a, a film for the BBC, and I mean, I let her do it. And um, 
you know, she just goes to school and it's just something else that she can have experienced and you have to do as you're told very much. So it was a very structured format she went into and, you know, now she knows a little bit more about something else, but I, I just want to put as much before her as I can. I, I don't foresee her in the business at all, no. I never ever wanted to do anything else. I don't know where I would have gone, what I would have done. I've had about um, eight years or so when I've not really had this great need to perform, but then I now find I'm missing it. So I, I just feel a little lost at the moment, but I don't really want to do anything else. I like being around actors. Um, I'm, I, I just like the way they talk. It's just a whole different way. You don't have to explain things to them. It's just like a shorthand sometimes. You all know what you go through, how you feel when you get a job, when you're not in work, and no one else can really understand that. So I like to keep around actors. But I yes. think what we've experienced that maybe younger actresses don't experience is being a member of a company. Now you just go to do one play somewhere. Yes. Yes. I mean, I yes. can remember being somewhere for nearly three years in Manchester in rep, and it was mainly with the same people. And it's wonderful because you actually, you know them so well that you dare to make an even bigger fool of yourself. Oh. Yeah. You're with them long enough that yeah. you know that they will just, they know you so well, they support you, and that's how you... You find things out. It, it, it is it's exactly what Wendy said this weekend. It's just being part of a company, and we have so much in common. Yeah. Well, yes, it, it must be um, influential on the viewing public. Otherwise, it, it, I don't think we'd be here today. Um, I, I suppose everyone, I can't just speak for me, influenced it um, in, in what they did. I mean, it wouldn't have been as popular if it wasn't as good. Um, I think now it would be lovely if there was room for it. I don't mean for me to be in it, because I think there's so much on television that is, um, is, is very strange for children. I think you can't hide them from things in the outside world, and I, but I think it's lovely if they actually experience a lot with the family, and that's what Doctor Who used to do. You would see it's very healthy to be afraid, but it's wonderful if it's in a family setting. It's a healthy thing. Mm. Hobbies. I'm terribly boring. I really don't have that many hobbies. I mean, I like reading. I like going to the cinema. Um, I, I like reading about alternative therapies, alternative medicine. I would like to know more about that. Um, but I, I just sort of do, I suppose, what everyone else does. I don't have any great hobby that I, I sort of do every day. As for music, I would love to be more educated about music. I would love to appreciate opera. I can't. I don't enjoy it. I love ballet. I, lo I, I don't go as often for, for, well, for all sorts of reasons. That I, it moves me so much. The stories for opera are much better than the ballet stories, but I love, I love the ballet. I would, um, and I would love to be able to sing. I can't sing a note. I really can hear when I'm out of tune, but I'm out of tune. Um, it's very difficult not to say Doctor Who. I, 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 I have to say that as well, because it was so different. It's something you're so identified with. And also, although we all played the companion, we all had our own companion, and no one else will ever play that. that she, yours is yours, Sarah is mine, and, and that, that means a lot. Um, what I did enjoy so much doing once was being cast for an episode of Zed Cars, because normally I was always cast as the good girl. And in theatre, I was always thought of myself as a character actress, even when I was much younger. And it was so nice that one director let me actually play a Liverpool scrubber. I mean, that's a Liverpool tart. I mean, she stole, she was awful. And it was wonderful. I put ladders in my tights and I pulled the hem of my skirt down. And it was just, it was just so lovely to, um, to be cast against type. Yeah. As, as, as how obviously people see me. And now, one of my favourite companions from Doctor Who, Sarah Jane Smith, Elizabeth Sladen. Thank you. It's been absolutely wonderful being back in Chicago. I want to thank Bob and Debbie for inviting me, and also to Louis for always making sure that it was all right by me with what I did, to Amy for making sure I was in the right place at the right time, and to all of you for your generosity, your kindness, your politeness, and I've had a wonderful time. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you.